Now you'll notice that he goes on in verse uh, 10 and 11 to give them a warning. They're about to go in to a land, this, this promised land, and they're about to inhabit cities that they didn't build. They're about to go in and start living in houses that they didn't construct. And so God's reminding them in verse 12, then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Back to the, the beginning, that word fear. Yeah. He yeah. doesn't – does he really want the Israelites going around with their knees no. shaking together and their teeth chattering? No, and, and when you actually read the book of Deuteronomy, the word fear comes up 34 times, and as I've gone and analyzed it, there's two ways of talking about fear. You have the fear of when I'm terrified, or we have this other kind of fear that's covenant-based. And in the book of Deuteronomy, 24 of the 34 are this other type of fear. So in chapter 6, as we've been looking, at, it appears in verse 2. It also appears again in verse 13. So I just want to take a minute and help you understand, as you're reading here and you're watching this repeated theme of fearing the Lord come up, we need to understand it correctly. And the KJV translators really got this. And as they're looking at the Hebrew, which does allow for a little bit of this fear, they see it as awe, not fear or distrust. So, so maybe reverence, respect, yes. So it's deference. a holy awe, it's a deep reverence for a God that you are seeing clearly in his divine character and feeling love for because of that divine character. In fact, Neil A. Maxwell said one time that in the presence of Jesus, you're not going to be standing. You're going to be kneeling <laughs> because you, you can't approach a divine exalted being and, and be in any way arrogant about it. And so the fear that you read in Deuteronomy is this awe, reverential awe, that comes from understanding what you're seeing in its power and its majesty and feeling reverence for that. And one Bible commentator I read said that this type of fear is about the heart. And here we go here again we go with the covenant language of love coming from the heart, and, and the covenant is helping me develop this kind of reverential awe for deity. So as you're reading through Deuteronomy, don't read it as God wants me to be scared of him. He wants me to be reverentially in awe of what he can do and what he will do for me. In fact, the, to, to build on that, Jan, if you look at the, the various motivations that we use or the motivators for, for certain actions, you can scare people into action. You, you can drive fear into people to get them to do things you want them to do. But that is – I love this idea that you keep bringing it back to – it's love is the driving motivator that God's using with us. And the fear that he's asking is, is once again, not, I better, I better obey because I don't want to be destroyed. It's more, I want to obey because God is so good. Yes. In fact, uh, when you study this word fear from the KJV standpoint, they say in here that this fear that you have, this reverential awe, causes you to love God more and to shun anything that would make him be disappointed in you, that you shun evil, you shun anything voluntarily because you know it would be offensive. That is the reason we're obedient is because we love and because we don't want to, you know, disappoint someone, not because we're quaking that we're going to be, you know, punished or something. So this just raises us to a whole different level in our relationship with God, which is what the covenant is supposed to do. That reminds me of the phrase, I don't remember it, but the paraphrase from President Ezra Taft Benson when he said, when our obedience ceases to be an irritant, then becomes, God will endow us with, with power. power. I, I love that concept. So if you're struggling with a commandment, whether it be tithing or the law of chastity or um, not not uh, bearing false wisdom, whatever, whatever commandment you're struggling with, instead of seeing it as, oh, I have to keep this commandment because God's going to be mad at me if I don't, but rather, oh, 
my efforts to keep this commandment that I've been struggling with are a show of my appropriate yeah. fear of God, my, my reverence to him and, and respect for him, and it's a sign that I love him and that I'm trying a little harder to be a little better. And, you know, the beautiful thing about this is, is when we realize that we're struggling with a commandment that we know he would like us to keep, the covenant relationship then allows me to go to him and say, can I have some divine power that President uh, Benson was talking about? Can you, because this is no longer an irritant, I genuinely want to obey this covenant, but I'm weak and this commandment's hard for me, but I want to for the right reason, it's not an irritant, then God can endow me with the capability of keeping it. That's that enabling, strengthening power or the healing power of the atonement, whichever one you need. Um, and, and the covenant allows you then to do things for the right reasons assisted by divinity. Isn't so. this fun? <laughs> it, isn't this fun? The covenant path honestly should not be drudgery. No. There, there are obviously some hard times, there's some difficulties, and, and those aren't fun, I get that, but all in all, the, this, this unfolding of, of God's goodness and his mercy and his grace and the fact that he's willing to give us these commandments being a sign of his grace, it, this, oh, is, this is exciting. It is. It's exciting. It just turns the Old Testament into a place you want to be instead of a place that you're grudgingly, drudgingly, <laughs> or you're hoping Running not to fall through. asleep. Yeah, you know, exactly. This great stuff here.